Welcome to the Genealogy Happy Hour, a place where new family historians can learn to document their family histories and celebrate their new discoveries. I'm Amy. And I'm Penny. And we're here to help you discover your family tree from the beginning. Welcome to episode 51. We're going to jump right into the wine first. Today we're featuring Domaine Saint Germain. Uh, today we're drinking a Pinot Noir from Burgundy, um, but um, this is a velvety smooth with raspberry cherry notes. It's a medium bodied red wine, but they also do a lovely Chardonnay. I love both the, the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay. Uh, from Domaine Saint-Germain, and this is a red that you like, Penny. I do like it. I do. I haven't had the Chardonnay, but this is delicious. So I'm excited about that. Yep. Now let's jump right in and um, start our program. Well, today we're going to be talking with Margot Note, who has an updated and expanded version of her book, Creating Family Archives, which is a step-by-step -step guide to saving your memories for future generations. And this book, we loved her first book, and we had interviewed Margot a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and I used a lot of her information in her book. And recently, when this one came out, it prompted me to dig out some stuff um, and by stuff, I mean my great-grandmother's jewelry that my mother had given me. And, of course, I had to call my mom and talk to her about that. And just said, what is all this, all this jewelry again? And get it all labeled. And I ended up putting it in little um, shadow boxes. Okay. So thank you, Margo, for <laughs> giving me that idea. And um, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so in this in this one, I specifically want to cover or talk to you about some of the uh, just a few of the chapters in the book, and you kind of go step by step as it says on the cover of your book um, to saving your memories and and, and whatnot. But I'm going to jump through towards towards the end of the book on um, processing your collections, which is your chapter seven. Okay. Um, and. In this one, you refer to the steps that are taken to prepare historical records like papers, photos, and audiovisuals for use. And during this process, you mention arrangement and description. Can you tell us more about those processes? Sure. So processing is kind of a umbrella term. And what it really means is kind of creating order out of the chaos. So especially with family collections of my own or with my clients, I find, you know, you just have boxes and boxes of stuff that may or may not have an obvious order. So processing is the way of going through those materials and finding the natural groupings of materials and removing um, things like staples or um, like rubber bands or ribbons and creating kind of looking at the groupings of the natural groupings of materials and arranging them in a way that makes sense in those groups. That's the arrangement part. And then ultimately the description is basically writing an inventory of what you have. So if you're looking for something in the future, you don't have to go digging through 10 boxes. You can look at basically it could be a Word document that tells you, you know, what's listed in each box or what's listed in each folder. And you can immediately know that, okay, what I'm looking for is in the fourth folder in the second box. Um, so it's basically creating an order um, that you know what you have and really getting what's called physical and intellectual control of your family memories. So you're organizing it, you're describing it or making some type of inventory, and then you're organizing in a way that makes sense. So I'm imagining that the arrangement, um, when you're making these arrangements of items, it's uh, I just pulled out a photo, uh, a folder the other day that had photographs in it. It had letters. Um, it had some emails that were printed off. Uh, and that's kind of what you're talking about. So I would arrange these in photo, you know, a section of just the photographs, a section of just the letters. That kind of, is, is that how I would do that? 
Yeah, so if you, especially if you have a large grouping of material. So let's say you just have a small amount of stuff that's related to an event. You might have photographs, letters, flyers. I mean, that could just be arranged in its own, its own single folder. But if you have tons of materials from your family, for, for instance, I had a client um, that I went to a storage facility and I was organizing his stuff. So he had a lot of t-shirts from his childhood or college years. So there's kind of the textiles of, you know, t-shirts, uniforms, and then that, that was kind of its own collection of stuff. And then there was paper documents related to his life. So I was able to arrange those things in groupings of elementary school, middle school, high school, college, career. And then he also had artifacts, so um, kind of all different types of awards or plaques, and so that was its own grouping in itself. So it's basically um, what I've what I found with a lot of family archives is a lot of times everything is just in a box. Like, and it just, any old thing is just thrown in a box. So it's basically taking those things out and seeing, you know, what makes sense for these groupings of materials. And there's no, there's not necessarily any tried and true ways of doing things. It's basically like figuring out what that order is with some collections. The the order is very obvious. So if you're dealing, let's say with, Um, business records or if someone's really good at filing things or you know have been very um, good at labeling things then you might be able to see oh this is all correspondence that's chronological so in that sense we want to keep that order that's already there and we can just look through and say okay this is correspondence from 1972 to 1973 and that's its own grouping so it's basically seeing what, what groups are there. And uh, what I really want to emphasize is not getting caught up in the individual items of everything. Because that's when you can kind of make yourself really crazy. And it's not necessarily worth all that time to organize everything at, at that item level. It's more thinking about what are kind of the natural groupings of materials that would make sense um, if you group them co- together. Gotcha. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because, you know, was, I was going to ask you, you know, and you mentioned, you, you talk about it in, in the book, um, but culling through the material as you're sorting it. But I find that sometimes you get bogged down with looking at each item, reviewing each item, and then the project doesn't get done because you're spending too much time going through all the materials when the project should be organizing and getting getting this stuff in order first so can you talk about that a little bit sure so yeah i mean that's so common and especially with family items like you know you want to reminisce over each photograph exactly but what yes. i and you can you know you can really go down a whole rabbit hole of memories um but yeah so i always want to emphasize is looking at um ultimately we want things that if they're physical We want them either at the box level or the folder level. So always thinking about grouping of materials. So let's say, and I I use an example in my book, but I can use another example. So let's say you have a series of photographs from a particular year. So you could spend all that time organizing, you know, chronologically these photographs from, you know, chronologically, you know, January to the end of the year, you might spend, I don't know, an hour doing that, but is it really necessary? Is it enough just to say these are photographs of this event at this year? Mm-hmm. Right. So I think it's it's ultimately, it's finding the kind of group, big grouping of materials. And then later on, if you're going you're going back and you want to spend some time finding that particular item you were looking for, you know exactly where it is in that box or that folder, and you're not spending all that time initially to organize it at every individual thing. Um, I think sometimes, uh, especially with um, digitizing, you can get into that item level, which gets much more complex but ultimately I tell people just to keep your sanity focus on getting kind of a baseline organization so think about 
what do you have that can be put in a box or in a folder or in a natural group? And once you have that of your all of your collections, if there's particular types, you know, parts of the collection that you want to have spend more time with or organize more um, more detailed, then you can spend your time and prior prioritize those those particular parts of the collection but there's no point in having everything super organized to that item level because it's going to take forever and it's ultimately not it's unnecessary as long as you know where the things are and there's a group that's enough for most purposes right and that, and and then i guess what you're saying is at, at some later date if you want to get down to that nitty-gritty then you can do that after everything the bigger project has been completed yeah yeah and that's the way that at least you know that you have that you know, you have everything organized at one level, and then you can go deeper. I mean, and especially with personal collections, there, there's going to be parts of those collections that are much more important, much more meaningful, that really require that extra time or you know, that really um, that speak to you. And there's going to be other parts of the collection that just have to be simply, you know, grouped and inventoried, and, and that's enough. Margo, do you have any um, labeling tips for labeling these connect, uh, collections? Yes, definitely. So I know sometimes I see, um, I always advise people never to use adhesive labels because they do stick on now, but later on they're just going to fall off. So let's say for folders, you would want to use pencil for the most part because pencil is easily erasable pen sometimes can fade or it can mark things up so you would use pencil on the folders that you have and then what's really important is to label photographs so with documents even if you don't know what a particular document is you can at least read it and get a sense of what it is with photographs you just have that visual image and there might be clues to who's in the photograph or when it was taken or what event was happening but ultimately you want to capture that information because it's not going to be obvious later on so there's different ways that you can label you can you know turn over the photograph and on an edge of it with pencil um, you can you can write the information so you can say you know who's in the photograph what it is or what the year is or sometimes um, I think the better way to do it is sometimes you can number photographs and then have a separate document that you can that has a correspondence. So photograph that's labeled one, you can put the information of everyone in the photograph, what the event was, what the year was. And that way you have basically a caption sheet that you can have as much space as you want to talk about what's in the photograph, but then you can also update you know, as you learn more information, a lot of times we inherit photographs where, you know, we get a sense of maybe we know who's in, in the photographs. You might have to ask some relatives. So with the caption sheet, you can always update that information without having to go back to the physical photograph and to update that photograph. Oh, I like that idea. I like that. Idea. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. In Chapter 12, you have um, it's called Store, Display, and Share Your Archives. I think that's where I got the idea that I need to display all my great-grandmother's <laughs> jewelry in these um, shadow boxes. When I mean, they look great. They look great, too. Um, you begin with location, location, location. Why is that so important? It's super important because a lot of times in homes... So then with people that, you know, aren't professional archivists, well, let me step back. So professional archivists, for the most part, are working in facilities that have temperature control, humidity control, pest control. There's control on the specific types of lights that they use. And that way, and also security as well. And that way things are kept at a steady temperature and humidity humidity level and that lessens the impact of the environment um, for photographs especially color photographs and documents and any type of artifacts that you have they can be particularly sensitive to high or low humidity or high and low temperature and especially that fluctuation so sometimes you know you might have a temperature humidity that's not ideal but if it's basically like at a regular rate, it's not as bad as if something's going up and down. Mm -hmm. 
So location makes a lot of sense because we want to put our most treasured items and parts of the house that have, you know, a temperature and humidity that's regulated, doesn't go up and down. We also want to make sure that we're putting things in places that that doesn't have like um, pipes or any type of heating elements or near a window. And so I always suggest um, people have things stored in their basements or in their attics, and those are bad places because of um, heat and humidity and pests and dust and dirt. And ideally, you'd want to put your stuff in um, an interior closet, like a bedroom closet or a linen closet. That It's protected from the walls. It's protected from windows, pipes, heat, and it stays you know, relatively clean because you're seeing it. Um, and it's not, let's say, in a basement or a garage or who knows where people keep things. So it's, it's kept safe. And, you know, for home archives, it's not like you're going to have a setup that would mimic, you know, professional archival repository. Yeah, but at least chance. you can minimize <laughs> um, some of the potential damage that might happen by just kind of being mindful of where you're keeping these materials. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I, here in Florida, we've got a lot of humidity. Yes. I, yeah. I think the thing that people don't think about, that I don't think about always, is how light damages these things, especially the older photographs. If you have old photos on the wall, if they're in direct light, it's they're going to fade over time. Especially yeah. color photographs. Yeah. I mean, they shift. They're going to mm-hmm. shift regardless, just because of the, the chemical nature of what they're made of made up of so yeah keeping things out of direct sunlight Mm -hmm. um sometimes keeping a copy you know you keep the original in a folder but you might make a beautiful you know copy and have that you know on a wall or i'm looking right now i'm in my in-laws house i'm looking at all their photographs that they had out here right and it's you know it's away from a window Mm -hmm. it's no direct light and it's kept in a relatively dim corner and so i know that those pictures are going to remain um, pretty stable over time. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Right. Oh, I'm just now thinking of my mom's house. She's got this beautiful uh, library table with all the old photos on it, not mm-hmm. facing the light, but there's a window behind it. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, Ooh, mm-hmm. that's probably not a good space for all those historical photos. So, Mom, if you're yes. listening to this, you need to find a new spot for all those photos. Oh my uh, gosh. Let's talk a little bit about digitizing our collections. Um, do we need to digitize everything and, and, and be scanning for the next hundred years? Or <laughs> do we pick and choose what we scan and then what is the best format to scan in? Sure. So do not digitize everything. It's not necessary. And I think sometimes what I, what I found, which is really interesting, I'll have clients call me and they say, we want things digitized. And I'm thinking, well, I don't advertise. I mean, I do digitize things for particular clients, but I don't necessarily um, advertise it because I'm not a digitization vendor. But I think what ultimately they mean is digitizing things makes things more accessible. Mm-hmm. So it's, so digitizing definitely is a way to share items um, across the world very easily. But digitizing is not for everything. So what I always suggest is first organize all the physical stuff. And once you have a sense of what you have, that you know, the physical and intellectual control of everything that you have, there's going to be certain items that are going to make sense to be digitized, and there's going to be other items that are just not necessary. So you might find these beautiful jewels of a collection, let's say a diary or really important wedding photographs or, you know, a, a beautiful memory that you have. And so that's worth the investment of time and money to digitize those things. And there's multiple ways to do it. And what I find really interesting is that I think the market is really responding to people wanting to digitize these family photographs and um, video cassettes. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can go about digitizing. So you can digitize things yourself at home with a scanner or a photograph. That's certainly for people that are more comfortable with technology, which isn't for everyone, but some people really want that hands-on experience. There's also, you know, local vendors or photographers that you can hire 
and they're pretty, you know, they're relatively affordable. Um, I'd say relatively, I mean, you want to definitely prioritize what you want digitized, but, you know, every, I, I feel like every town or city has at least one type of studio or place that can digitize things for you. Now there's, uh, increasingly, there's kind of national companies where you put things in a shoebox, you send it off, and who knows what happens to these materials, but they get digitized somewhere. You get the originals back, and you get the digitized copies back. Um, I'm kind of hesitant to send things off in the mail, like priceless family Mm -hmm. um, memories, but that that is definitely an option. Um, And then there's also a lot of historical societies and libraries that are setting up kind of memory labs. So they either um, teach you how to digitize things or they have a setup that uh, you can just go and schedule some time, use a scanner, use... um, uh, you can digitize uh, VHS tapes. There's there's kind of that. Uh, the community centers are really starting to pick up on that, and that's really cool to see. I think for libraries, it's a really great way to get grant funding, and it really gives back to the community. So it's one more way that the library serves the community or the historical center center serves the community by offering these personal history days or home movie days where people can really learn about how to preserve these things because digitizing is just not it's it's just not simple it's not necessarily an easy step and i should also say too that digitizing itself like you know the act of digitizing like scanning or photographing things that's actually the easy part it's more thinking about what do you do with those files afterwards so with digital files, they don't maintain themselves well over time. They can become corrupt. They can become, um, it's something called bit rot, bit rot, where they kind of start to fall apart over time. So you def- definitely have to maintain digital files a lot more self-aware than you have to, like with paper documents, for example, you can just keep them in a the closet forever, and unless something horrendous happens they're still going to be readable or digital files need upkeep over time so that's why i always advise people like if you do want to digitize things let's be thoughtful about what we're doing um and let's make sure we're doing it right the first way and not not spending a lot of money for something that ultimately might you know be useless in a few years yeah, that's good. a good... Yes, good, definitely good thoughts. I will tell yeah. you, I have used um, a national company to digitize some, not V well, VHS, and the little, I can't even, those little tiny VHS, they're not VHS, but whatever they are, mm-hmm. um, that I used to take of my kids. Um, I sent a bunch off just to try it, and, and it came, and they sent them back, and I have it on um, a DVD and on a flash drive. And they're just, you know, it seemed to work out really well. And my mom has um, digitized all her slides, and she did those herself, which I can't imagine because she had thousands of them. (laughs) (laughs) But she was good because even when you're doing this kind of stuff, um, you know, like you said before, to, to, you know, decide what needs to be digitized and what doesn't, a lot of her slides are like scenery of places, and nobody needs that. Because yeah. you can get scenery pictures mm-hmm. online from the places mm-hmm. you've been to in the mm-hmm. past, so there's no reason to right. digitize those slides. You right. just want to do the ones of the people. You do mention um, that negatives... If you have the negatives of a print, that that's better to scan than the actual print? And I'd never thought of scanning a negative. Yeah, so that kind of gets more in the weeds of things. So, yeah, negatives are, are better to scan just because it's the more kind of crisp. It's, it's the original versus a copy. So um, that is an option. I mean, a lot of times what I found with scanners is that, is that they'll have... Um, you know, you can scan with the bed itself, which can be as, usually it's like paper or legal size. Mm-hmm. And then they also have attachments for slides and for negatives. And then it's simply, especially for negatives, you can just set the, 
using whatever program you're using for scanning, you can set the system up so it'll scan a negative. Mm. Yeah, and, and it just it, it just um, ultimately has a more crisp, more defined photograph or you know copy than the original uh, than the photograph. Um, but you know sometimes you have to think about is it you know how much of a difference is that going to be made if you know sometimes it's just easy enough just to scan a photograph yeah um but that's why i always advise people um especially when they've had those kind of old school um you know the envelopes with the the print photographs and the negatives like always keep those things together like it's nice Mm -hmm. that people store those things together because ultimately you have the print photographs but you also have the negatives if you wish to digitize from them Mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point interesting Interesting. i'm gonna have to try that scanning a negative just to see how it, it comes out um, let's see. Okay, well, what, the last question I have for you is in the section where you have why, why file formats matter, you discuss the different types of file formats, um, like the TIFF and the JPEG and PDF. And are, are those the ones, I, I know you highly recommend the TIFF, but is that, um, and I think about this a lot because, um, as our listeners know, I've been working on my French genealogy where I've been getting a lot of documents from this little town in Alsace, and but they come in as a JPEG, um, so I'm just keeping them as a JPEG, uh, you know, when they come through, although they are documents. Um, what do you recommend, like, on your, what, what are the ones you suggest for file types? Sure. So for documents, so let's talk about TIFFs and JPEGs first. So um, I kind of, in the book, I kind of talk about them as being kind of like paper plates in fine china. So JPEGs are the paper plate. So they're small files. They're easy to send. They're, you know, you can see them on websites. They're just so much. And every, every computer can open up a JPEG. So they're very accessible. But TIFFs are a more complex file format, and ultimately, with any with every image that you have, you want to have you know the lower res easier to use JPEG, and the higher res master TIFF. And the reason why is because TIFF is a big file because it's uncompressed, um, which ultimately means. And this is getting like, I'm trying not to make it sound too technical, but (laughs) when you open up a JPEG and you open and close a JPEG over time, the reason why a JPEG is smaller is because it's being really smart about the pixel information it contains. So if you open and close it over time, you start to lose that information. It's... um, it gets the image, I mean, and this takes quite a while to get to that point, but the images gets kind of um, less clear over time, where TIFF is always going to retain that, um, all that, those values. So it's very easy, and I should say too, TIFFs are very large, and a lot of programs can't open those TIFFs, mm-hmm. but they're good to keep, um, like if you have Photoshop, for example, that you can you can look at them. But ultimately, for images, you want to have that high-res TIFF, that archival um, TIFF, and then the lower JPEG. And so if you have a high-resolution TIFF, you can always easily with like batching programs or image programs you can create smaller jpegs from that master um Mm -hmm. tiff now i found i think this is very common that a lot of archival places are sending documents as a jpeg rather than a pdf Um, what i would suggest is um, changing those jpegs into a pdf and ultimately something called the pdfa which is our archival type of PDF. So it's a way that it captures the information um, and it, it captures the information within the document and makes it sustainable over time because there may be formats that aren't available later on or, I mean, it's much more complicated, but it's a way to capture that document information. Um, so and simply, it's simply a matter of, sometimes you can do it with programs like a batching program to do a batch conversion into PDF, or sometimes you can just, you know, I think right-click it and change it into a PDF. Um, 
it's pretty simple to do and it's just a way to make sure that you have the formats that are sustainable over time over the long term and what's nice about images at least is that we have um everyone has kind of come together as a community worldwide to say these are the standards so that's really helpful like there's some other um there's other file formats, let's say, for video that people still haven't decided on what the ultimate format is. So in the future, that might be a problem. But we know that you should have JPEGs and TIFFs of every image. And I talk about it um, hopefully more articulately in the book where I, I kind of talk about what exactly you need, like the specifications for um, for example, 300 DPI, that's 300 dots per inch uh, or PPI pixels per inch, and that gives you a resolution, a clear resolution that's printable versus online you can have images that you don't need that high level of resolution. Um, It's kind of funny because writing that chapter, I mean, I, I wrote a book, basically that's about that chapter, so it was very hard to really condense that information into, you know, a couple pages that that I th- hope is accessible for people yeah. and gives them just enough information without getting super complicated. Cause I could just go on and on about <laughs> digitizing things, but it's like, what do people need to know? What are the highlights of what can they arm themselves with, with these projects? Yeah. Yes. It is very complex when you start getting into all these different formats that we can save on. And we're very used to the JPEGs that we can upload to Facebook or share um, with an email, but Maybe having the, but it's important to have those, like you said, the, the TIFF archival version of those images and, or the PDF, if it's a document, those types of things. So um, as we wrap up, uh, what do you want our listeners to know um, about your book? What, what are they going to be um, going to your text for? And, um, you know, just kind of give us an, an overview for our listeners. Yes, so I created this book because I knew that I wanted to kind of be almost like a missionary of the archives. So I know that uh, I want to inform people, but I also want to advocate for my my field, like ultimately what archivists do. And we don't, you know, they're not really well known. I mean, unless you've done some major, um, well, I guess if you've done genealogical work or if you've done major research, you might visit an archives, but not everyone ever steps foot in it. But everyone has things that are, that are important to them, that are their legacy, that are the things that are meaningful, that are passed down through their family, that they've collected, that really kind of show their legacy. And so I wanted to create something that was easy to read and accessible and really helping people. A lot of times when I talk to people, they're kind of overwhelmed by their stuff and they don't know where to start. And it just seems like so much, so much stuff to do in a, in a world where, you know, everything is competing for our attention. So I really wanted to create kind of a slim, Um, accessible guide that really educates people on what they can do to save their stuff and they can do it in a way that is um, easy and cost effective that's the other thing too I see people sometimes spending tons of money to digitize things or to have things organized where it's really not necessary so it's like what is the minimum amount of information you need for the maximum impact. Um, And ultimately, I want people to read this book, to give this book to family members, to share this book, and really take um, ownership of their stuff and empower them to really have stuff that's important. I was looking at, um, there's a book called The Art of Swedish Death Cleaning, I think it's called, where it's talking about you know, people going through their material possessions kind of um, later in life and really saving the stuff that they want to pass on. So I think that's important too. It's like if you want your children or your grandchildren um, or your community to know about the stuff that's important to you, 
organize it now so let's say if something happens they can tell okay these are really important documents that are organized in archival boxes rather than you know shoveling through all these memories later on it's like do the work for them to share that information and i think ultimately that's how we are all connected we all have memories and legacy and materials that are important to us so let's put in a little bit of effort to organize it and make it sustainable over time. Yeah, my collection of all these French documents that I have now, of course, I, after doing all this work, I'm like, who is going to want or appreciate this? And I've decided that my granddaughter is getting it, whether she wants it or not. And she will, she will take it, and she will love it. <laughs> but I think, to, to Margot's point, if it's organized already, it it's going organized. to have a little bit more meaning than here's five or ten yes. boxes of Here's a bunch of documents. Good luck with and that. And photos yeah. that, are, you know, that aren't labeled that need to go. So I yeah. think that it, it, we are going to bring meaning to future generations yes. if we organize our, quote, stuff right now. And Margot's book gives us not only the path, but allows us to take this, oh, my gosh, there's all these boxes or all these piles it's just too overwhelming and breaks it down and so it's not overwhelming and it's actually quote doable yeah so well thank you so exactly. much margo for joining us again um it's always enjoyable and you know one of my new year's resolutions was to um you know get through some of my piles and um but some of that is just work related but um you know Again, bringing organization to uh, your home office and your life is always a good thing. And for genealogists, yeah. it's, it's, it's critical for us to do some good genealogical research. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Please email us with any questions or comments at genealogyhappyhour at gmail.com. Visit our website, www.genealogyhappyhour.com, for additional resources, books, and wines. Don't forget to drink responsibly. And never drink around genealogical documents.